In our last lecture, we challenged some of the central tenets of research by considering interpretivist alternatives to the positivist approach to research. Today, we're going to do it again, only this time we're challenging the premise of why we do research in the first place. So far in this course, we've largely focused on what is called basic research, research that is primarily focused on advancing our general knowledge and explaining phenomena in which we have an intrinsic interest. While we may have a specific real-world case that sparks our interest, the larger goal is typically a bit more abstract and general. But in many cases, your project may focus on solving a specific problem facing your company, community, or personal life. Practical research like this, which focuses less on general knowledge and more on specific real-world problem solving, is called applied research, and it is the topic of today's lecture. Basic research is frequently criticized for being isolated and abstract and not meeting the needs of real people in the real world or connected to real world outcomes. Scholars are often talking to each other in the literature and not necessarily focusing their research or their communication about their research to the general public. If we return to our analogy of the cocktail party, it's as if only scholars get invitations. Applied research uses many of the same methods as basic research, but for a different purpose. It aims at applying the knowledge that we have to the creation of solutions to problems. New products, medicines, feats of engineering, programs, you get the idea. This doesn't mean that basic research has no practical value. Without basic research, we really can't have applied research. Applied research is typically about applying the findings of basic research to producing something new and usable. And basic research can give us answers to all kinds of interesting puzzles that can inform policies and decisions. Both kinds of research are therefore valuable. It's the models and theories of basic research that often drive applied research. We're going to focus on three kinds of research that would be considered more applied than basic evaluation research, action research, and product and market testing. Evaluation research is appropriate for questions about the need for, design, progress, and outcomes of a particular action. It uses many of the methods of basic research, experiments, surveys, case studies, but for an applied purpose. This isn't about abstract concepts or ideas, but about finding solutions to problems faced by real people, groups, and companies in the real world. It's typically used to evaluate policies and programs in businesses, organizations, and government. The goal is generally to assess whether a particular action or program should be initiated, continued, or terminated. Therefore, this kind of research has a normative rationale, and your results may therefore include normative recommendations on how your client should act. Evaluation research is similar to basic research in that this is still a systematic approach to knowledge creation with transparent methodology and a neutral researcher. You still need to consider your variables of interest. That is, you need to know what outcomes you're assessing and need to consider the factors that influence the achievement of those outcomes. You also need to consider all the relevant issues with populations and samples and ensuring that you can gain access to the subjects and data that you need to conduct an accurate evaluation. Theory and causal mechanisms are just as important to this kind of research as they are to basic research. But other things are different. You as the researcher may be assigned your topic rather than choosing what you find intrinsically interesting. You may be required to do this kind of research by a boss or client or as a follow-up on a grant. The rationale is often driven by demands for accountability or to justify the money, time, and resources that are going to be or have already been invested. As a result, this kind of research can be politically tricky. While you still need to be neutral, you may be under more pressure to reach a certain conclusion, as continuation of a program may depend on a positive evaluation from you. This can create an ethical quandary for you that would need to be navigated. Your results can literally affect lives, as jobs may depend on whether or not you recommend the initiation or termination of a program. Another difference is that typically in evaluation research, you aren't interested nearly as much in generalization. 
Your primary task is to evaluate the specific programmer action, not to extrapolate from your findings to evaluate all such programs. You still need to maximize internal validity in your project, but the external validity may be less important. In terms of methodological design, all the methods we discussed earlier can be used in evaluation research. Surveys, for example, can be used to evaluate the needs of users and their perspectives on the effectiveness of the program. Experiments can also be highly effective. You couldn't compare a group that was involved in the program to one that wasn't. Participation in the program is essentially the treatment, allowing you to assess whether the outcomes of interest improved in that group versus the control group. Case studies, too, are a common approach to evaluation research, as you can dig in-depth into the particular outcomes and how and why they occurred. All of the trade-offs you face in picking a design for basic research apply here, and in some cases more so, since you may be constrained not by your own resources or timeline, but those of your client. There are a few kinds of studies that can be done in evaluation research. First, there is the needs assessment. Similar to a diagnostic study, a needs assessment is often completed before a new program or action starts. The researcher assesses the status of the organization, business, or group of interest and considers their needs. Uh, this may include diagnosing inefficiencies in operations, areas of success and weakness, avenues for new opportunities, or changes desired by users. By consulting with stakeholders, the researcher determines what kind of action, if any, is needed in the first place. Uh, typical methods for a needs assessment or diagnostic study include surveys, focus groups, and interviews with stakeholders. All of this typically occurs prior to program creation, as the results will themselves drive the creation of the program. For example, let's say you work for a company and there is anecdotal evidence of a morale problem. People grumbling in the break room, snark during meetings, and higher turnover of employees. Informal conversation may clue you in to some reasons for this low morale, but you don't know whether the reasons given to you are representative of the wider workforce. You also don't know how solvable these problems are. Are they due to salary considerations, benefit changes, lack of transparency from upper management, personality problems with new hires, or something else? You could conduct a needs assessment to figure out the sources of the discontent and then target policy changes based on what's reported. Another kind of study is the formative assessment. Formative assessment evaluates the implementation of a new or ongoing program. The goal here isn't to evaluate whether the program or action has met its stated goals, but to provide feedback on the current structure and processes to improve the delivery and implementation of the program. Surveys, interviews, and focus groups again will be instrumental here, as will analysis of documents. We contrast formative evaluations with summative evaluations. Uh, this is where you're assessing the impact of the program or action, how effective it has been at achieving its stated goals and other outcomes of interest. Then you're essentially giving the program a grade and ultimately indicating the ways in which it has been successful or not. Surveys, focus groups, document and data analysis, and interviews are still useful here, but you might also conduct quasi-experiments. You might do pre- and post-tests to see the impact of the program, or compare participants in a program to subjects who didn't participate. As you can see, these three different types of evaluation studies take place at different stages in the lifetime of a program, before, during, and after. Depending on the needs of the client wanting the evaluation, you might do just one of these or a combination. The key is to remember that even though this research is applied, driven by external interests, and has more normative elements than basic research, it still uses the same methods we've discussed and operates under the same basic principles of scientific research. This is also true of our second type of applied research, action research. Like evaluation research, the distinguishing feature of action research is not so much its methods of design or data collection and analysis, but its purpose. Action research aims at finding collaborative solutions to specific real-world problems for a group of actors in a community, and it's typically conducted by professionals operating in a particular area working hand-in-hand -hand with the community members. 
Unlike much of the basic research we've covered here, it's not focused on generalizing results, but instead on solving a particular problem. Similar to evaluation research, action research is less about the puzzle or question that interests you, and more about what is needed by a particular community or group. It's central to research in education, healthcare, activism, and human rights for those reasons. Where it differs from evaluation and other types of research is that the practitioners and members of the community are actively involved in the research, not simply as the subjects that you study, but essentially as part of the research team. Action research is largely considered to follow a cycle. As with most research, you start with a research question or problem, but that problem may not be defined by you, the researcher, but instead a community of interest. You'll ask them about their experiences and how they understand the problem. Note the difference there with how we conduct basic research, where we don't necessarily choose our sample or population until after we've chosen our question. I did warn you that the scientific method is not always a strictly linear process. In action research, it's a cyclical process. Once you've defined the problem, you then introduce some kind of change or treatment and then observe not only the effects of that treatment, but the process of implementation and the responses of the community to those changes. After evaluating all this, you then make further adjustments, treatments, and changes, repeating the cycle until the problem is addressed. In a way, action research can be considered a democratized type of research, where for once the opinions and decisions of the researcher are not followed in an autocratic way. Subjects don't simply do as the researcher dictates, but are involved in the decision-making process and benefit directly from that involvement. It's rather like walking into a college class and the instructor announcing that you'll make the syllabus together in an equitable way. In his book on action research, Ernest Stringer has a simple framework for approaching action research. Look, think, act. It works as follows. You define your problem that you aim to solve. Then you look. You observe and describe the specifics of the situation so everyone is fully briefed on the full scope of the problem. Then you think. You analyze the available data to understand how and why this problem came to be. Then act. Determine what change or action is needed implement the change, and observe and assess the results. Then you repeat the cycle until your assessment shows that the initial problem has been solved. Note the difference again between action and basic research. With basic research, we conduct a study to answer a question, but that question might be abstract. It might be, where is the best brunch in town, or do democracies fight autocracies more often than they fight each other? Answering that question doesn't necessarily make a difference. It doesn't mean that a particular brunch place will get more customers or that the nature of government regime and warfare will change. We acquire knowledge and communicate it, but change, if it happens, may be incremental and we may not even be aware of the impact of our research. Action research is different. The cycle of look, think, act occurs in a complex context of actors or practitioners who face a particular problem that they want or need to solve. The research aims at addressing that particular problem, with the researcher acting as an agent of change, not simply an observer. The goal is to solve that problem, not simply put findings out into the ether for other researchers to read. For basic research, the stakes are often personal. We have a question that interests us that we want to answer, or we're incentivized to do this research by our job. The stakes in action research are broader. They originate from those outside the researcher who are heavily invested in seeing results. The same thing goes for the role of the ideas of the researcher. In most research, the ideas and interpretations of the researcher are paramount, and we often assume that a set of ideas that works in one context will work just as well in a similar context. In action research, the experiences, ideas, and interpretation of the community members are as important, if not more so, than those of the researcher. And the specific context of the particular community and the complexity of that context matter a lot. We don't assume that programs or changes that have been successful in one environment will work just as well in another. As an example, consider this very great course on research methods. 
I teach research methods regularly to undergraduate and graduate students, but how I teach it to my students is very, very different from my approach in these lectures. It's largely the same material, but the context is quite different. I hope you don't mind my going meta for a moment, but it really can show how context matters. The main difference is in the structure of the learning environment. You're listening to me at your own leisure, maybe in the car or walking to work, at the gym or at home. You can't interrupt me to ask me questions as my students do in the university classroom. I can't see if you're nodding along, puzzled, or falling asleep and adjust accordingly. I can't assign you exercises or homework to check your understanding, and you can't prevent me from going meta to illustrate my point. Since some of you are listening to an audio-only version of the course, I can't rely on visuals either, even though the video audience can see them. I have to rely on my words alone to explain everything just in case. This has fundamentally altered my approach to this great course, what I cover, how I cover it, down to the very language that I use. The context matters enormously in how I solve the problem of effectively teaching a course on research methods. I probably need to engage in some evaluation research to see how well it's working. I think the meta thing is working, none of you are telling me otherwise, so I'm going to assume it's fine, but let's stay with it for another moment because this great course also illustrates other principles of action research. In fact, the very creation of this great course can be considered a product of action research. Think about it. The great courses identified a problem, an absence of a course on research methods. We consulted with some great courses users on whether this would be something they would want. They answered yes, so we developed this course in response to that need. Now, you'll probably point out that this isn't exactly the collaborative process that action research aims at. After all, you didn't get any say in the content of the course. I didn't consult with each of you on what kind of research you hope to do. As the expert, I made the decision about what content to cover, and I chose to cast a wide net to cover a wide range of research approaches so that there's hopefully something for everyone. Plus, it's to your benefit to know all these different methods, even if you're partial to one particular kind of research. In practice, action research is a balance between the needs and ideas of the community and the expertise of the researcher. So the content development wasn't democratic at all, and that's okay. Democracy in research isn't always a good thing. There can be too many cooks in the kitchen. But where the action research principles show back up is in the follow-up. We'll get feedback from all of you on whether or not this course meets your needs. Maybe you're hungry for even greater detail. You might want an entire course on action research. We'll get that feedback and respond to that need. Eventually, the problem in our community, the lack of enough research methods training for the great course's audience, will be resolved. We looked, we thought, we acted. In this way, every great course is a result of a type of action research. So if you've decided you want to engage in some action research of your own, how would you do it? Well, first you have to identify a community to aid. This may be a community you already belong to and want to assist. It may be a new community that faces troubles that you think your expertise might be able to resolve. Or you may be brought in by a member of a community to assist them with tackling a particular problem. As with so much of methods, you generally choose action research because it's the best research method to solve the particular problem you face. So you probably aren't going to decide to do action research and then find a community. Instead, you'll encounter a community that requires assistance and realize that this method is the best one to meet their needs. Once you've found the community that could benefit from action research, you have to clearly define the problem that needs to be solved. Remember that action research continues its cycle until the problem is resolved, so without a clear definition of that problem, you won't know when to stop. A group may know they have a problem or multiple problems, but may differ on how they characterize that problem. You'll need to get a complex understanding of the entirety of the issue they face so that you can be comprehensive in your approach to solving it. Defining the problem isn't enough, though. You also need to determine clear key indicators of both progress on and the resolution of the problem. In the case of the great courses, our indicator might be the production of a course that meets the methodological needs of its listeners. For a project in education, it might be attainment of a certain average test score for the students. In our research on morale in the office, it might be high marks on a survey assessing morale. 
Once you know what those indicators are, you need to determine your baseline. So you know where you are at the start. If your action research focuses on helping a group of people lose weight, for example, it's not enough to define the problem and determine the goal. You need to know what everyone weighs at the beginning so you have a baseline against which you can measure progress. Next, you need targets, short-term and long-term. Sometimes if you just focus on the final long-term goal, the community can become discouraged because the target seems too far away. Returning to our weight loss example, this is why a lot of diet assistance programs focus on short-term goals as well as long-term goals. You may earn a badge or prize when you lose 10% of your body weight, even if your ultimate goal is to lose 40% or more of your body weight. Finally, you need a way to measure progress on both targets and outcomes. We can never escape measurement, can we? For our test-taking students, the test itself would be one measure, but you might have other measures of progress, such as students' self-reporting of more time spent studying, or our observations of students being more focused in class. For our weight loss example, it might be the weekly weigh-in on the scale, but it could also be a journal that indicates changed behavior, or monthly measurements of inches lost, or focus groups where participants indicate their progress towards their targets. Once you and your participants have determined your outcomes, indicators, baselines, and targets, you're ready to take your initial measures. Then you introduce the agreed-upon changes, the new style of learning for the classroom or the new weight loss regimen. You continue to monitor progress, taking measures and checking those against the baselines, and consulting with the participants on their experiences. Data can be collected through any of the methods we've discussed — interviews, surveys, observation, document review, or focus groups, which we'll discuss shortly. As you analyze the data, you might determine new problems that were previously not considered and need to be addressed. Perhaps issues at home are affecting student performance in the classroom, or underlying medical conditions are affecting efforts at weight loss. You recommend changes in light of this new information and continue to check the indicators to see the effects. The cycle continues as needed, always with the input of the participants who are the ones that are ultimately responsible for creating the processes and change that could lead to a resolution of their problem. Remember, the goal is to eventually solve that initial problem, not to test whether your first particular intervention is effective. You may end up encouraging many adjustments and changes along the way in an effort to achieve the goal, and to establish processes in the community that might help them solve other problems in the future. As we've said, it's a very different approach and motivation than the research methods we've considered before, but it's still grounded in empirical observation, measurement, and testing. So maybe not so different after all. That's it for action research. Let's turn to our final form of applied research, market and product research. Market and product research could, like so many topics in this course, get their own course. This kind of research focuses on determining what people, what consumers, want. That means that it aims at determining the preferences and interests of potential consumers and tailoring products and programs accordingly. We've already discussed several methods of doing this. Interviews and surveys, for example, aim at asking people directly about their preferences. You can also conduct experiments by giving different groups variations on different products and observing their reactions. And you can do comparative case studies by looking at people in one area and seeing how they responded to a set of options or products, and evaluating whether another group of people with similar demographics might respond in a similar way. Another way to do this kind of research that we haven't talked about very much yet is through focus groups. Focus groups let you interview small groups at once, and they are a common tool in market and product research. They can be a nice alternative to interviews when you have a shorter window of time to talk to subjects. You can talk to several people at once rather than in one-on-one -on -one interviews. So they can be an efficient and relatively inexpensive way of getting individual perspectives. They also allow for interaction between subjects in a discussion format. This can be particularly useful if you want to observe social dynamics and how people respond to each other. In this way, focus groups can be a nice combination of interview and observation. Since the subjects often drive the conversation and talk to each other, the researcher can sit back and observe. The group setting also allows for creativity, which is why focus groups are often used in market research. You can give the group a particular product, 
give the group members time to use it, then observe their interactions and get their reactions. Of course, there are drawbacks. Running a focus group and keeping everyone on track requires considerable skill on the part of the moderator. You have less control than in a one-on-one -on -one interview since there are a lot of people involved in the discussion. That means you'll probably cover less ground and the group can go off topic or be dominated by a few voices. The same dynamics that might inhibit truth-telling in a one-on-one -on -one interview can operate in a group setting where subjects fear immediate social repercussions for saying something unpopular. This is one reason why many focus groups are now run in an online setting. The relative anonymity of the online setting can lower inhibitions against sharing personal information or potentially controversial opinions. It also allows you to include a wider diversity of people in your focus group as your participants need not be physically located in the same place. This is particularly useful if you want to demonstrate a digital product that you model for your subjects and then elicit their reactions. I've participated in a number of focus groups for textbook publisher companies. As a college professor, I'm their principal customer. I'm the one who chooses the textbooks my students will have to get. Many publishers are turning to e-textbooks and integrated systems where the students have access to a number of features besides their text, study materials, assignments, and other online resources. This kind of focus group performs double duty as both a source of research on reactions to the product and ideas for new features, but also as an opportunity for a sales pitch to those considering the available textbook options. Regardless of how you run your focus group, keep in mind that the claims you can make about your results may be limited. The typical focus group may have no more than 10 to 12 people in it. That means that even if you choose your subjects randomly, it's unlikely you'll have a representative sample. As we've learned before, this means you can't necessarily generalize from the results of your focus group. This is one reason why researchers will use multiple focus groups or combine the focus group with other methods to ensure a broader set of perspectives. This brings us to the end of our section on research design. In the third and final part of the course, we'll learn how to organize and evaluate our data and communicate our results.